Uh, my name is Ms. Stefan Ewan, and um, I'm talking about stateful serverless and the elephant in the room. Maybe just just very quickly about about me and uh, the background also of this talk. Um, so I'm, I'm one of the the co-creators of the Apache Flink framework. Um, I'm not sure how how much this is known in in the like in this in this meetup audience. Um, so Apache Flink is a is a system for for uh, stateful stateful stream processing, um, it's it's I think more you know coming out of the of the data processing real time data processing um, yeah big data infrastructure um, community. So I'm I'm not I'm not hundred percent sure how how much uh, like whether you've heard of it um, before or not. Um, you don't need much. You didn't no need to know much about Flink. Um, this talk is, is is largely independent, even though it 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 builds on. On, on top of the system, yeah, we um, we created this as a university spin-off, if you wish, here in Berlin. Um, I think by now, almost six years ago, um, founded a company around it. Um, was acquired about two years ago by Alibaba and is operating as a subsidiary now. Um, and we're we're continuing to develop, you know, Apache Flink as an as an open source system um, for for big data processing. But um, like we're more and more looking also into use cases exactly for for stateful serverless um, um, yeah applications and that's what I would like to um, to focus on in the in the talk today and I'll, I'll also mention what the elephant in the room is uh, in, a, in a few slides into the talk all right um, you might have seen these these here before the Dilbert comic and the the tweet from Kelsey I think both went kind of viral but um, I, I still put them on the slides here anyways even though they're they're probably almost a little overused now because they they do really, I think, um, create create the right motivation for for what we're doing here. Um, the whole effort of of the stateful serverless um, of the stateful serverless effort that we're doing here is is really on the level of trying to build build an application framework that can can make building distributed applications easier, like one level up from the infrastructure layer that is technologies like Kubernetes and so on that make, you know, like the, the deployment um, and the, yeah, just the, the handling of infrastructure style problems really easy. Um, what we're trying to do is is really rethink the, the application layer um, and, and, and some of the inherent paradigms we're doing, um, like we're using there to, to make it easier to build to build um, like reliable and scalable applications, maybe to to, to break this down in 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 my own words, um, the the thing that we're trying to solve is really the the problem that it's still hard actually to build a, a scalable, consistent, stateful application, and the, the problem is like putting this on an on a fancy stack is actually still kind of you know doesn't solve the whole doesn't solve the whole problem. You you have an easy way to to deploy it then, but if if the interaction between your um, your application and your database isn't well thought through, then no matter how how good your tooling around it is, you'll actually have issues around scalability and consistency. So, the the idea is, can we can we do something similar as um, like what Kubernetes did on the infrastructure layer on the on the application layer, like a, a distributed application framework library that you know if we if we start to use this not just in our application, but I think we need to think application and and state so. Think database here um, as one. If we actually apply this there, can we can we get something that is you know I, I just put magically scalable there? Um, it's of course not going to be completely magic. Nothing is, but you know it's it's just going to put us in a in a good in a good starting position to build these kind of really easily scalable applications. And and scalability here is um, it's really just one one aspect, right? We're we're looking, of course, um, at, at various concerns in that space, like scalable computation, state, state consistency is a big thing, but also security, observability, and so on. So in this talk, I would really like to focus on, on these three parts, scalable computation, scalable state, and, and consistent state. This is kind of what we've been working on um, in, in the in the Apache Flink community for for a while, and I think there's some some really good ideas in there that if we if we actually start to to combine them and merge them with some of the ideas that have come out of this like um, yeah of the of this of, of this space here modern application architectures cloud native application architectures if I think if we try to put them together we can we can actually 
can actually do something really nice. So um, the, the talk is, is actually titled St Stateful Serverless and, and the Elephant in the Room. Um, what, is the, what is the elephant in the room? Um, the elephant in the room for me has, has always been the, the database. And, and I'm not thinking, you know, like SQL versus key value store, but like the general idea of how do we actually use databases and key value stores today from, from our applications. And this like request response interaction that we have with databases, you know, we do, we send it a, a key lookup request, it gives us the value for a key. We send it a, a put, put value for a key request, it tells us, okay, has worked or didn't work. Um, I think there's a lot in, in that that didn't change over the years, but it's something that needs to change. And as long as we're, um, as we're sticking with that, I think we'll, we're, we're going to have a bit of a problem. And the, the database is, I think, a little bit the elephant in the room when, when it comes to this, this building of big scalable application. It's kind of a thing that many people see as the problem, but nobody really wants to, wants to do something about it or replace it. It's become, it's become such a core Core, core thing for for many reasons. You know, it's well understood. It has very well established, you know, operational. There's a very good operational understanding around databases and so on. That that, that very few people really want to change anything about it. But here's here's a bit of a let's say maybe provocative talk that that we should actually think um, rethink this a bit and and maybe do something about that if we if we really want to. Um, if we really want to arrive at this at this next level of yeah stateful serverless applications um there, i'm going to give you a brief teaser um in in which direction of, um some of these solutions that that I'll, I'll be talking about today are going to go this is one of my um it's one of my favorite papers of of all times it's it's quite old by now it's probably more than 15 years or so um been, yeah, it's been written by 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 Pat Helland, and it it introduces this idea of of not not really trying to build with distributed transactions, but trying to build. If I can sum it up in my own own words, trying to build with stateful event driven entities. It's, it goes almost in a in a bit in a direction of of actor style programming. Um, not 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 quite. There's there's some some subtleties there, and there's also a lot of ideas in the paper that, that go beyond actors. But in my own words, this is really the core idea. And I think even 15 years later, there's a lot in this paper for us to, for us to exploit. Um, and and, and we're, we're, I think we're going to see how, how something based on that idea is, is, can actually carry us pretty far, pretty far in this space. So maybe the easiest way to, to approach this, you know, I've, I've said a lot of very high level, very vague things. Now let's try to make this more, more concrete. Maybe the easiest way to do this is by, by me just explaining what we've actually built with stateful functions. And then we're, we're going to look a little bit at how, how this is actually different from, from some of the you know, classical um, database centric um, yeah, application patterns and, and approaches. Yeah, so um, the 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 one liner it's not quite a one liner it's two liner here for stateful functions is it's a polyglot event driven functions for distributed stateful applications and um that is quite a mouthful so let me let me try to break this down what this is all about there's two aspects to it there's um as as with many things that that you know talk about distributed application architectures there's there's the architecture behind it and then you know an, an, an api um in which to to develop against against this architecture. So to express the you know like the the concepts that this that are inherent to this architecture in a, in a good way. So let's actually start with that side. Let's start with the side of um, of stateful functions. What what does it what does it give you as the as the developer when you want to build distributed stateful applications? Um, the the core building block of of stateful functions are obviously functions stateful ones as the as the name suggests so we're we're really writing we're really writing functions here you can think of them as you know as, as functions as with functions as a service aws lambda or something like that um that you can write in you know in in, in many languages they're they're strictly strictly event driven 
um, invoked through messages and designed to not, not compute resources when they're inactive. In a lot of ways, you can also think of them as actors, except for, for the fact that that they have this this virtual notion to them. So you know when they're not invoked, they're they're actually not there. The other part of, of the name stateful function, as it implies, is, is actually the stateful for nature. So, so each of this function has access to, to local and consistent state. So rather than saying, okay, we have you know, we have these pure functions and let them talk to a database, really trying to, to bake state in here as a as a first class concept. So you know, every every function access a state pretty much as in a local variable. So it is invoked with with a message that comes. For example, um, let's say we're um, we, we have a handler for an e-commerce platform, and the message is put something in the cart. Then the message is put put something in the cart together with that something, maybe a pair of socks because you know winter is coming. And um, the state is 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 the shopping cart, and uh, you just update it as in as in a local variable. And in this um, in this abstraction, you you don't really worry about what happens. And the important thing is you really don't worry about it. It's not like you have an an, an ORM framework framework in the background that that tries to pretend you're working with local variables, but there's really like a ton of SQL queries, and you have to be very conscious about what's actually happening and what happens if things go wrong. Um, this here is really meant as an it's a local variable update. You you care as much about this succeeding or not succeeding as you would with any any operation in your local process. The other part that is um, that is here is that these these functions can also exchange messages. So they they send messages to each other. Um, you know maybe the shopping cart function might send messages to the inventory functions um, in order to you know update update the stock. Might might send something to the checkout um, process function, and so on. So again, we can really see there is there is some similarity to to actor programming here. Um, with the difference of like having this this baked in notion of consistent state and messaging. And for both of them, what this abstraction here really assumes or or get, or lets you assume is you can send messages and they don't get lost. They arrive exactly once. You operate with state and it is it is going to be it's going to be fine. Like you don't have to worry about transactions working in the background about failures um, and retrying. So this, these are really aspects that we that we get completely out of out of the picture. Um, ideally, you actually work purely with these functions and state. You start everything by by you know by in an event driven way by by subscribing to certain event ingresses. And you're publishing your reaction to the outside world by publishing messages to event egresses. By really keeping keep, keeping this this paradigm, the only way to interact with the outside world is with the ingresses and egresses. And otherwise, we're really just functions messaging each other. And with state, we can actually guarantee an extremely high level of consistency out of the box. So as an as an application developer, you have to worry about about nothing there really. The um, the thing that's worth mentioning here, maybe early, even though we're going to go into into that in a bit more detail um, later, is the runtime for this is is actually different than than for many other um, I think frameworks that have been built. So there's there's no database behind it. You don't actually need an, an extra database. the The way that persistence here works is that that these functions and and messages or the state of the messaging is periodically snapshotted to some some mass storage, be that something like S3 or Google Cloud Storage, HDFS, MinIO, or so, just anything that can write a file, really. So um, rather than having to deal with, you know, like scaling a separate database, you really just need to make sure you have some some form of capable mass storage. And um, it was a pretty conscious decision because those are like this is, I would say, like almost the minimum requirement you can you can get away with. These systems are very, very mature, very cheap, very easy to very easy to run in comparison with many other things with databases, for example. So how how does it um, how does that look from from an, an architecture perspective or from a runtime perspective now? So going going back a few slides, we saw you know you have this this idea of of building functions and messaging, and you know you don't have to worry about messages getting lost and state getting lost. It all sounds fine, but you know how how is it actually how is it actually run in practice? So the the way that this is um, this is deployed is basically 
with um, with with a system that we sometimes call um, something like an event-driven database. So it, it takes the role of an of a database, but also um, deals actually with with messaging. So it takes the messages from the ingresses. It takes care of routing the messaging between the function, and it takes care of um, writing the messages to the egresses. So that's the that's the upper part here. That is where we have the um, Apache Flink state for function cluster, taking care of the state of messaging, communicating with the outside world with ingress and egress. And the actual application logic is um, is actually deployed behind um, behind a, a, a service um, or or a similar endpoint. Like it can be in can be something like AWS API gateway. It can be a, a Kubernetes service and so on. So you can you can actually deploy these functions. In um, just in a, in a in a stateless container deployment and, and operate it pretty much exactly like that. So all the state and messaging really happens through this upper layer here through through Apache Flink and the the lower part the application code really runs purely in in, in pure and, and stateless functions that you can actually you can actually operate them just as any other stateless component even though you actually write stateful code in there. You write code that accesses local variables and so on. Um, you can still actually treat it, treat it pretty much as stateless. And the, the important part here is that um, state is provided actually to these functions by, by this upper component, by this um, stateful function cluster. Whenever, whenever a function gets a message, with let's say you know handle handle this action on your shopping cart, it actually gets the state of the shopping cart as part of of that message directly. So it can manipulate that and then send this with a response. So after this one message processing is done, the the container is or the function is again stateless, and and invocations are if you wish item potent by default that way. Let's actually focus a little on on this aspect because I think this is maybe the um, the most important difference, I think, in how this framework approaches things compared to, I think, most most other solutions um, that, that that we're seeing these days. So, if if you're if you're looking at a traditional database application, how it usually looks is that the application logic itself is the is the start of of things. You know, it it receives a request by RPC by yeah or directly HTTP from from the um, from a client device, um, or it picks up a message from, from a message queue. So um, in any case, everything starts in the application. The application takes that. And then it it talks to the it, then it talks to the database, makes um, you know, gets some state, updates some state, and then it it writes it writes a, a message again to an um, to to a message queue or it responds to the RPC call. Now the the thing is that the fact that message and state here are are handled kind of with different with different systems or with different protocols even I think is is one of the core things that makes a lot of things very hard um, in order to you know to guarantee especially consistency here but also also around scalability yeah you have actually very different very different um, scalability characteristics for for these two sides. If you wish, the idea of, of stateful functions or the idea of using what we sometimes call event-driven database here is to, to turn this actually around, to actually invert the role of the application and the database in this case here. Um, the, like everything starts actually with the, if you wish, with the database. The, the component that receives the events from the ingress is, is the database. It can actually take these messages, it can route them to the shard that owns the state, and from there, supply these messages and states together to the application. And then it, it calls the application whenever, whenever that part is done. Um, it can also Im implement pretty sophisticated scheduling there, like for example, making sure that only one, one invocation per, per state entry is, um, is active at, at any point in time. Similar as you know, with actor systems, you don't want more than one function manipulating a certain inventory entry at any point in time. So you can, you know, you can enqueue update messages and, and schedule them one after another, and you invoke the application whenever you know, the circumstances are right. So, the, the the driver of of the interaction is i would say in the in the in the in the classical application a database application architecture it's it's the application itself it's the one that takes the message that makes request to the database 
in, in this event-driven database architecture, the, the driving force here is, is this event-driven database, the stateful function cluster. It takes the messages, collocates them with the state, and then invokes the application. So the application becomes the, the reacting part rather than being the acting part. And the database becomes the active part rather than being the reacting part. We kind of, we kind of flip the roles between the two. And it, it might sound a bit strange to do this at the beginning, but it, it actually leads to some, some very nice properties um, if we think that through to the end. Let's actually make this a little more concrete. How does it, how does it look if we're actually running you know, a use case, a use case to that? And I'm, I'm going to go back to this like, very simple example with, um, with, a, with a, a service that manages a shopping cart. So um, what we have here is, is, a very, is a very simple setup. Let's say we're, we're, using, um, a, we're using um, our, our database tier here, or in, in this case, our Flink stateful function cluster has, has two, two shards, two partitions, right? We, it's a very low parallelism. This scales to much higher parallelisms, but just to, to illustrate the example, we just have two different different parallel charts in the system. <clears throat> we, have one, um, we have one ingress message queue. You know, think of it as something like, like Kafka or RabbitMQ where all our, where all our messages are. Um, so in, in, in that sense, we, we assume everything first goes into some, some messaging system, a bit like, you know, a bit like an eventing architecture. So the, the message comes in that, um, targeted at here at um, a card for Kim. So um, if we look at this and if we decompose this message, every message will go to a certain type of function. The type here is, is card, and then it will go to a certain function instance or function ID. The ID here is, let's say, just the username of the user that you know, goes shopping. In this case, it would be, it would be Kim. And we're, um, and the, the message itself is, an, is a message add to card that says, okay, I want to add I want to add three socks to this to this shopping cart. So this message first enters the system in in, in one partition in in partition A, and this one um, is rooted to partition A, and the, because this one is the one that actually owns owns the state for Kim, um, or for Kim's cart. Then um, then this one actually dispatches this to our our shopping cart functions that are that are defined behind an endpoint. Let's say it's behind a, a, behind a Kubernetes service. Um, so we're, we're basically dispatching this message, add to cart, three socks, and the state of the current cart, which is currently empty. Um, the, you know, this is a very simple action that the, that the function does. It simply manipulates the state of the cart, and then it, the function produces another message, namely um, updating the inventory. So the, the response is a resulting state, let's say a card with three socks and a message to the inventory type function um, with the, you know, the ID socks and say, you know, request three items. And then this message is routed to the, to the shard that actually owns this specific, um, this specific function type and, and instance, namely socks and an inventory. And here we we basically then do the same thing. You know, we dispatch the message. We um, we attach as the state to the message the current the current state for this um, for this function, namely how much how much uh, socks do we currently have in stock. And then this function is expected to you know just update that and produce the resulting message. Be that you know we're out of stock actually, <laughs> action failed or or whatever you want here. So. I hope this kind of illustrates a, a bit how we're um, how we're looking at this, how how messages and state are actually both rooted within this this one component, this um, event-driven database, and how the the application logic is is pretty much pure functions, if you wish, that just are invoked with with the message and with the state, and they respond with messages and with state. So there. Application logic is, is is pure as in the functional programming sense, right? No side effects here, and um, also the the result purely depends on the uh, depends on the invocation uh, parameters. So we can we can pretty easily see if if a, if an, let's say a connection here fails. Let's say this this invocation that we have here of the inventory service, if this fails, 
we don't really have to worry about, oh, did this go through? Did this materialize any side effects or not? We, we basically we retry it, right? There's only one owner for this specific for this specific entity. Um, let's say the, the the inventory socks, and this one can you know it can it can keep the ownership. It can know did did the request fail or not. Um, within this specific system here, I'm going to go into that in in a bit. Within the this event driven database, there's basically a a transactional protocol in making sure state updates and messages um, happen and so on which also integrates the communication with ingress and egress. So we can actually give the user the, the impression that, that all these messages and state updates happened, happen exactly once. And where we cannot guarantee the exactly once semantics, namely the invocation of the functions itself, they're basically item potent by definition. So we don't, have to, we don't really have to ask the user to pay, pay any special attention there. Let's actually look. How would this how would this look like if we if we actually um, now set this up on on um, on the system like uh, like Kubernetes? If like what components are involved there if we if we build this? Um, there's actually there's actually surprisingly few requirements that we need for that. So um, one thing is we do need uh, a cluster of of link stateful functions that can be just a deployment. I'm um, going to talk about that in a, in a, in a bit. Um, you don't actually need to worry about persistent disks or anything there, like unlike for most databases. You need to connect it with some systems that act as the event ingresses or egresses. For example, Kafka is a good choice, but um, you can also use something like Kinesis, RabbitMQ or so. There's, there's a lot of connectors in the, in the Flink project. You do need one system like S3, HDFS, MinIO or so to store your, your state snapshots. So you, you actually have durability. And then you deploy your application logic on, um, on something like um, yeah, a, a Kubernetes deployment and just, just do it exactly as you would otherwise do it. Put your, in this case, for example, Python code in a container, um, serve, your, serve it with your favorite um, HTTP um, server framework and, and you're pretty much done. If we look at this on, you know, on, on a cloud stack, let's let's take the AWS stack here. Um, it looks pretty similar. We can use uh, AWS Kinesis as ingress and egress. We would deploy stateful functions on something like the, um, yeah, on something like EKS or so. Um, we can deploy our functions as as Lambda functions behind an API gateway and basically register the API gateway with the state fund cluster in order to to handle the um, to dispatch the requests and um, we do our snapshots to S3. So this this is there's one point where I, I want to just briefly spend a minute and um, and and make um, and, and talk a little more, more about this because there's a um, there's a specific philosophy here also in this in this architecture that is that's very much on on purpose and um, yeah. It's, I think it's an interesting it's an interesting idea and in how to how to look at this um, how, how to how to develop these these ar application architecture stacks right now. So what what we really have here is if you wish two to three two to three tiers right We have the application tier which is just arbitrary user code on something like like uh, a state stateless deployment or on lambda. Then we have this state and messaging tier. Um, which is Flink or something else that follows this paradigm. And then we have basically durable storage. So the durable storage here is, is a completely separate thing, right? It doesn't, storage is not part of the, of the middle tier of the state and messaging tier. The middle tier is actually, it doesn't assume any durability of its local disks or anything. It, it uses them a lot for caching, but it really um, assumes durability only of the, um, of this of this durable storage tier, which in turn really just has to store files. So this gives us, I think, an interesting separation of concerns here. So we have the the stateless tier, which is stateless and very fast and elastic. Where there's the state and messaging tier, which is still somehow stateless. So you know, even if all containers die at the same time, you do not have data loss, but it needs a lot of local caching for performance. 
So it's moderately fast in its elasticity. Like you can scale it in and out, but it's it's not completely, you know, it, it doesn't happen every, you don't do it every second, like in a in a way that, for example, Lambda would scale. Um, there's there's a caveat here, like this, um, the way, you know, Apache Flink works right now, scaling is, is something that still disrupts message processing for a certain amount of time. We're working on making this, you know, less disruptive, but at the moment this really, like, this really means it's it's probably best used for near real time use cases rather than you know very hard real time use cases. And the the durable storage tier, it's really something where you know scalability is not not much of a concern because it's all about it's just about adding adding more disks. Right, files just live wherever they live. There's no there's no no real need to to think of um, you know migrating anything or having any having any issues with like scaling up and down it's it's kind of a soft problem this this tier i would say all right the yeah i have it here as an explicit point like this this middle tier state and messaging really has no has no durability concerns it all works with just with asynchronous snapshots to the to the durable storage tier let's actually make um, let's actually look a bit at at how this how this looks in in action and maybe give you an example of an, an application that, that we can build with that. And the the example we picked here is um, is a billing application. So um, assume you I don't know you have your Spotify subscription or something like that, and um, every every month or so you you get invoiced and they they subtract. They, they, you know, they pull something from you via via your credit card. Um, how would that look? So, let, let's say the first thing that that we build here is we actually need to know about what subscriptions exist, um, and we do want to let's say we want to attach this payment service to to some existing infrastructure. Let's say you have a database that manages all your users. And we're going to, you know, we're going to grab the messages from there. Let's say by some change data capture or so, and putting it into into a Kafka topic. So they basically, they're basically all the messages that um, that describe changes to subscriptions. Then we define we define a, a user function here um, that that takes these events and. Um, and this function has in its local state, let's say the ID, the subscription status, um, the billing interval that you that you picked, and so on. So it's, it basically has all the information that it it needs for billing. And you know, if the subscription change comes that says, you know, this user actually is not using the service anymore, then this function basically gets deleted or gets inactivated. So what this function does is, um, as a, as a first thing, it doesn't need to, of course be working all the time because subscribe subscriptions is a periodic business so we're using another feature that I, I didn't talk about here before but that's that's um actually message message delayed message sending or timed messages so what the user actually does is it schedules a message for the next um for the next billing date when when the next payment would be due so the next time this message is actually received by this user function, it actually creates a, set, a new function, let's say a payment function. And this, this function's sole, sole purpose is to, to see one, one payment process through, you know, like talk to the credit card uh, service, make, make sure it handles uh, failures and retries and eventually concludes after I've retried three times and it was rejected. Maybe I'm, I'm going to report the spec that this month wasn't paid. Um, and then the user function can decide what to do with it. So this one actually talks let's say to credit card processing. And um, I mentioned it before, ideally all, all communication to the outside world works through something like uh, event ingresses and egresses. So in this case, we're actually, uh, we actually say we're, we're talking to our, to the, to the credit card processing, let's say by, by two, two Kafka topics, one um, to send the, one to send the, the request and one to handle the, the response. Um, so something that that I think why this makes an, an interesting example is that it's it's really it's pretty annoying for users if they actually get billed twice for something, and it's really I think annoying for the service provider if they if some 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 billing requests get lost, right? So 
in let's say in case there's there's a failure of the of the process that handles a payment function, we, we do want to make sure we don't actually in, accidentally enqueue another another message here into Kafka, um, so that there would be two messages processed or so. So having having nice durability guarantees here, uh, sorry, consistency guarantees here is, is really something something we we appreciate. Let's say from a from a high level use case description, let's actually look at um, at at some at some some code. How do you how do you build this? So the first thing is actually defining defining functions um, that the that the you know the the stateful function. Um, Event-driven database should should be aware of, and and we can see this on the left side. We're actually defining two two types of function: a subscription, the subscription function, and the payment function. They're actually behind um, behind two two HTTP endpoints um, through which they are invoked. Um, we de we define some state that they have, you know, some parameters around timeouts and message batching and so on, um, and that's that's pretty much it. Um, on the right side, we actually see two of the ingresses that we um, that we defined. So um, they're both of the type routable protobuf ingress on Kafka. So they're basically taking taking protocol buffer messages from Kafka, and they're they're taking the um, the key from from Kafka as the um, as the name of the the function that should be involved uh, invoked, like the user ID or the payment ID. The application itself could then. In, if implemented in Python, look look something like this, right? On the on the upper left side, we're um, we're looking at the subscription function here. Um, we're basically saying that we bind this this function here to handle everything that goes to goes to the subscription function. They could they should call this model function here, and then we're doing some some protobuf some protobuf calls here to to figure out okay is this a protocol buffer um, message that describes a new subscription, is it a timer message, is it a result of a payment, um, and then, you know, dispatch it to the, or yeah, invoke the right, um, the right function here. And if we, you know, if we look at the, at the code here, um, the most important thing actually to notice is that there's, there isn't really any type of, there isn't really any type of, you know, failure handling code in here in the sense of what happens if actually, you know, some state update goes wrong, what happens actually, um, do we have to, you know, retries, do we have to worry about timeouts? It's, it's really all basically, it's really all pretty much business logic and some, some protocol buffer packing and unpacking and, you know, otherwise, otherwise thinking about really the, the logic that you have in here. Um, so this is really the the application code. There's a little bit of of plumbing around it. Um, if you want to run this behind an HTTP endpoint, pick your favorite um, HTTP server. We're using Flask here. Um, import the request reply handler and then basically bring the whole thing up to you know to run behind behind some port. Make sure it's the same one that you defined in the um, in the module definition here. And yeah. Create your create your Kubernetes service to to point to that to that um, deployment and and you can pretty much run it. Um, let's actually quickly look at 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 some of these um, at some of this like in action. Um, I have a recording here. I wanted to be on the on the safe side with all the all the remote talks and so on. So um, I'm going to use this recorded demo. It's not it's not quite live, but I guess with the remote with the remote setups, that's that's how it goes. All right. So what what we see here is is actually a deployment, a pretty standard deployment. We have these um, we have stateful function master and three workers. These are pretty much our fewish database processes. There are three you know three actual processes that do the message um, routing and um, and on the state. Um, one master to coordinate them, and then we have two deployments for the um, for the subscription function called the sub subscription worker here, and for the payment functions. So they're they're just regular um, regular deployments, Kubernetes deployments, um, and behind behind a simple a simple um, I think cluster IP service in this case. Um, this is the the left window on the bottom here shows the log from the um, from the payment worker just. So we can see log messages later in other parts of the demo. 
we, we don't see much action here. So I'm pretty, I'm just quickly showing you that something's actually going on. We're, we're switching to the UI from, from Apache Flink that gives us an insight about data flowing around. So we're seeing it's, it's a moderate setup, right? We're processing some 500 events per second in each chart. So 1,500 all in all. So it's a fairly low data rate for this demo. Um, you know, we can we can do the the common things we can do with Apache Flink, like look at um, is the ap uh, application getting back pressured? Can we actually keep up with the data rate and so on? Um, can get some insight into into tasks. Um, how often did they fail? Like, what is the aggregate data amount that they're that they're receiving in in their messages and so on? And one of the things that is as I mentioned here, pretty crucial is, is actually consistency. So we really don't want to have a situation where um, where user um, receives a double um, receives a you know a, a payment twice. So we actually built a bunch of of, um, of of sanity checks into the into the payment function and say, you know, if you actually get a get a response for a payment that you didn't believe that you triggered, like raise an alert here. And, and, and that's exactly what we're doing. We're actually faking uh, an accidental trigger for a payment. And we'll actually see that this, this function um, gets that directly. And the way we actually fake this payment is by, by just writing a message directly to Kafka that doesn't come out of our function, but we're just using you know simple console producer to actually put it there. And what we'll actually see is that you know we're, our payment function is immediately complaining and say, okay, there's a there's a payment here that we that we didn't expect. Um, now we can do it another time just to just for the, the sake of illustration. So the the next thing here um, that I would like to um, I'd like to look at is what what actually happens if we if we hard kill all our, our payment workers at the same time, meaning we're killing them while they're in the middle of um, of state uh, updates and writing messages to Kafka, right? And um, so we, we we make sure we actually terminate them without grace period or anything, getting them restarted, um, you know, reconnecting the logs. And the interesting thing is we're actually not seeing a single complaint about some inconsistent uh, payment message here. Um, everything is exactly in, in sync. So all the the killing of these these workers, there's like there's nothing that we had in the code to take care of to for consistency and it, it just it just was provided for us out of the box here and yeah going back to the going back to the presentation that is really the um that's really the the thing that we get by this like nice integration of um of everything um here in this in this event driven fashion right all the all the functions talk to each other they get their their state consistency out of the box, and they talk to the um, outside world purely by by these ingresses and egresses. Um, and the the integration with those is actually is actually transactional. So whenever you send something, if if anything in this in this um, in the communication between functions goes wrong, then also the messages that are published to the outside world are not really published. So everything is taken care of consistency wise here. I do have a few slides on Apache Flink that I think we need to, um, I can't go through many of them just for, for the sake of time here. Um, just want to briefly mention, um, if, if you're interested in this, I think the I think Flink as a whole is actually a pretty interesting framework. Um, it does it does a lot of a lot of things. So we're um, we're building this event-driven applications, um, stateful functions on on one. API aspect of it, so it it supports a lot of things like streaming, streaming SQL analytics, um, uh, stateful stream processing, and yeah, and all of this on on top of this this fabric that basically is computing computing over data streams um, and doing asynchronous state persistence through snapshots to to a system like uh, S3 or so. Um, I, I drew another component in here, Zookeeper or etcd console. This is basically it's a it's a small it's a small effort only that goes that goes against that component. It's basically just process leader election. So all of the all of the effort that the application of the work that the application actually does, you know, and all the transactional guarantees and message exchanges, they're not done by you know heavily hitting Zookeeper or etcd. They're really handled by by the framework um, directly. 
Um, yeah, actually, Flink is is a system that has has been used for pretty crazy large scale um, with with many petabytes per day being processed and and event rates of of billion, no, actually trillions of events per second, no, billions of events per second, trillions per day, or yeah, on 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 tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of CPU cores. So this is um, this is pretty pretty crazy scale, um, but it doesn't have to be that crazy scale. It actually also scales down pretty nicely to to very like very small setups, like um, like yeah, small IoT devices. Um, which I think is again actually because of this interesting architectural approach that I mentioned earlier, like this the separation of of having you know, the, the the messaging and state for tier being independent of the um, of the durability tier and and working with asynchronous snapshots. I think it's a it's a very flexible and very scalable approach to do things. Let's actually, skip over over the rest because I think I'm running out of time. I would like to leave some time for question. Um, just briefly. Um, this this project is part of Apache Flink. It's developed by a handful of people um, in, in in addition to to me. So actually, those folks do a lot more work. So they they actually deserve sort of more credit than I do for 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 this work. Just happen to be the one presenting today. And um, yeah, I hope I hope I could give you a, a, a rough overview of what we're what we're doing in this project, and I, I yeah I hope I could actually interest you a little bit in this in this idea of of rethinking um, rethinking this approach to to application building, especially event driven application building. And this like if if you want to take two things away from from this talk, I would say um, take away that this this inversion of the role of, of database and application is actually a pretty a pretty neat trick like making the database also responsible uh, responsible for the message processing and making it the acting part and the application the reacting part is, is a pretty neat trick that that allows you to build things with a with a very high consistency out of the box and and the second thing is this um, this architecture that we're trying to um, to to build here with um, with Apache Flink where where we're actually building like it's almost like a key value store style tier that doesn't need local disks but basically works only against against um, re remote storage like s3 which is which is much easier to handle um this is still you know there's still a lot of work to be done on that level um it's getting it's getting better with every with every release but i think it's a very it's a very promising um promising architecture promising approach to do things yeah that is it thank you very much and um I'm releasing the screen here and uh, handing it back to Ashish.